other side of town from Jonathan, Brian Head Welsh was growing into a drum-obsessed ten-year-old when his father, tired of carting the kids' growing kit all over town, suggested a tactical switch to guitar. Within a month, Brian was mastering Queen riffs and loving every minute of it. James Monkey Schaefer's introduction to the axe came about in a more unusual manner. Slipping out from his parents' house under the cover of darkness to attend a kegger one night, the 14-year-old monkey cunningly managed to trap his finger around his bicycle chain. According to the MD on duty, the injured digit would recover quicker if the youngster took up an instrument. Fortunately for us, monkey decided against the clarinet, but was sold a right dog of a guitar by head. A battered PV mystic, fleecing the novice for all his worth. Another regular fixture in Brian's garage at the time was Reginald Arvizu, alias Fieldy. Encouraged by his musician father, Fieldy took up the bass because, well, everyone else played guitar. For a Bakersfield lad, Fieldy's musical taste at the time seemed exotic and strange. Growing up amongst 80s big hair metal bands, listening to the rap and hip-hop grooves of Grandmaster Flash, Africa Bambata and Public Enemy must have gone down like a parent at a keg party. It was Fieldy's love of the funk that was to play such an important part in Korn's groundbreaking sound and an acceptance of such diversity in modern music. In the late 80s, however, big hair metal, as defined by acts such as Motley Crue and ACDC, wanted nothing to do with this newfangled stuff, where people talked over records, sometimes not even their own. In America, hip-hop and metal did not mix, period. Although no one bothered to tell the youngsters of Bakersfield at the time. These friends played in a variety of bands during the late 80s, chopping and changing amongst the tight group around the Bakersfield scene. You find places like uh, pizza places and churches that, that will kind of uh, loan out their place uh, as, as an, an act of offering, you know, it's more, more charity than anything. Um, and that's, that's what makes it quirky and, and that's what makes it uh, kind of a little more spirited than, than in like Los Angeles where, where a scene could be supported openly like that. The first band of any merit was a big hair metal five-piece called Ragtime, featuring Fieldy on bass and Head on guitar. The band's name was designed to embarrass the girls, and the group indulged in all the spandex, lycra-fluorescent hairspray excesses of this embarrassing period of hedonistic 80s music. One can only assume that hip-hop Fieldy developed a fantastic sense of humour and self-irony. In Bakersfield, they went down a storm. Over in the Davis household, things were going from bad to worse. Rouse with his new stepmother, the demons from his childhood, coupled with the inevitable head trip of adolescence, sent Jonathan over the edge. By the late 80s, Jonathan was listening to a wide range of music. He was particularly into goth, industrial synth, a new romantic pop of bands such as Kraftwerk, Bauhaus and Duran Duran. This brush with new romanticism would see Davis sneaking off to school with bags full of makeup and hairspray, landing the quiet loner into all sorts of trouble amongst his predictable redneck Bakersfield school peers. He was even taken off to see the gay student's counsellor because he wore makeup. Regular beatings and constant calls of queer, faggot and HIV would eventually lead Davis to adopt the taunt as a nickname. Jonathan eventually had HIV tattooed on his arm as a final finger to all those rednecks who made his school such a misery. Music, however, was always there for Jonathan. By now, his father had taken over the running of a large recording studio in the town, Fat Track Studios. The singer Buck Owens was a major country and western draw for Bakersfield, even sporting its own museum to the man. Rick Davis was a long-time collaborator of Buck's and jumped at the chance to run the studios. By the 1990s, Jonathan was predictably into synthesizers in a big way, an exotic sight in Bakersfield at the time. 
The luxury of a large recording studio must have seemed like heaven for the disturbed youth to retreat into. At this time, Jonathan started sneaking off into the bright lights of LA to see breakout Bakersfield bands such as Cradle of Thorns, now signed to Korn's record label under Video Roam. The impressionable Davis recalled how these trips made him so happy he would literally shake with joy, making it hard to keep the car on the road. Ragtime would eventually fall apart as Fieldy and Head were keen to break out in new musical directions from the other members of the band. During their last high school years, Fieldy started playing around with his old friend Monkey and together with Head put the feelers out for a new drummer. These were far and few between in Bakersfield as most teenagers instinctively chose the axe as their weapon of choice. In what has now become a legendary part of the corn mythology, Fieldy was to encounter his eventual rhythm section sparring partner in the form of a message left on his answering machine by a 13-year-old boy. However, the group's smiles were well and truly wiped off their faces when they heard the skull-crushing noise produced by one David Silveria. David had been banging away on the skin since he was nine and without a single lesson had become quite an accomplished drummer. The four would continue to play together, on and off for a couple of years whilst they finished high school. Beckoned by the sirens of LA's thriving club circuit, the group were ready to break out of the small town. The band were keen to shed their small town roots, so they first moved to Redondo Beach for six months. Here they were known as the boys from Bakersfield. They then moved again to Huntington Beach where they became the boys from Redondo, finally shaking off their Bakersfield legacy. People that are from LA like to root for bands that are from LA. They li it's like when your best friend plays minor league baseball, and, or he went to your high school, you want, you want this guy to make it to the pros. It's kind of like that with bands from LA. They're playing the Roxy, now they're selling it out. I want them to get a record deal. Then they get a record deal. Now you want them to sell records. But then once they start selling records, it's kind of funny. People kind of get upset when your band, when you saw them before they had a record deal, now uh, Jimmy, who lives in the gated community, also likes them. To reinforce their solidarity with their new founded adopted home, they even took up the name LAPD, named after the LA Police Department. What had initially stood for Love and Peace Dude eventually became Laughing as People Die in an attempt to harden up their act and ditch the hippie connotations. Head, meanwhile, would return to Bakersfield to earn some much needed cash, but would join the band for gigs and tours. Now joined by vocalist Richard Morales, LAPD fitted well into the Huntington new punk and rock scene at the time. The band lived in poverty for a few years as they slowly gathered a reputation amongst the thriving pub and club scene of Orange County. But the times were good, and if you're going to be penniless, you might as well be it in a warm, sunny, surfer cool resort such as Huntington Beach. Here, the group would eke out a simple existence, spending most of the money on booze and living off hamburgers with any spare money. Uh, yeah, they played over at, uh, they played at, at Bam Bam's Mars uh, downtown a lot, and that was, that was where I saw them a lot, and I think uh, that's, when, uh, that's when the group I was in uh, played with them. And they, were, they were a bit heavier um, than us. They, they were playing uh, that kind of uh, what we call dirge metal uh, at the time. And, uh, and I was in a punk rock band, so it, was, it wasn't as easy to, uh, to like, say you dug them. Uh, you know, I was, a, I was a snotty punk. 